we're going to condense your decades of experience, <laughs> like decades into one YouTube video. And I'm not lying, you guys. This is the kind of shit that people spend. I don't think I can swear on YouTube. YouTube, cut that out so that you don't hurt my organic reach. <laughs> um, <laughs> whoops. Yeah, whoopsies. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that people pay a lot of money for. Hey Posse, what's up? It's Alex coming at you this week with a very special interview with a brilliant marketer, copywriter, and strategist who will seriously change the way you think about marketing. But first, if you're new to the crew, welcome. Right here on my channel, you'll find hundreds of practical tips and tricks to help you master the world of online marketing, copywriting, psychology, influence, and more. So if that sounds good to you, be sure to subscribe below and don't forget to ring that bell to be notified when my next video goes live. Now, I am very excited to introduce my guest this week, Sean Twing. Sean ran a successful digital agency from 1998 to 2021, running campaigns and strategizing offers for massive players like Agora Financial and Legacy Research. Today, Sean has teamed up with another OG in the marketing space, Andre Chaperone, who is one of the first copywriters I studied and learned from when I got into the world of marketing over a decade ago. Together, they write more than 200,000 words a year, crafting iconic emails, courses, content, and more. So when it comes to the world of copywriting and marketing, it's safe to say that there are not many people who get it better than Sean. In this exclusive interview, Sean is gonna condense 25 years of experience working with more than 240 clients, completing more than 750 projects, managing more than $100 million in ad spend, and teaching thousands of students around the world the single most important skill they need to become a top 0.01% marketer. Yep, I am talking about the one thing, the one marketing superpower that separates the 99.99% of decent copywriters from the 0.01% who are exceptional. And you'll have it by the end of this interview. Can you guess what it is? Comment below and let me know. Now here's the interview. Hi, Sean. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm so excited you're here. Oh, me too. I've been so, I've, we've talked about this, that was like a month ago, and I've had about 75 ideas for this conversation, and they all coalesce today into an outline that I'm pretty sure we're not even going to get to. So I have no idea what's about to happen, and I'm beside myself excited. That's the best part. It's like the marketing mad scientist brain that literally goes in a million different directions, and that's going to be the beauty of this conversation. I freaking I love wait. that you're here because... I don't do a whole lot of interviews on my YouTube channel, but when I do them, it's because literally I had a conversation with someone that was so mind blowing. I'm like, the posse needs to know about this. And so a little bit of backstory on how Sean and I got connected. Uh, those of you who have been following my YouTube channel for a while, uh, particularly who have watched a video that I, that I did outlining some of my favorite copywriting courses that I myself have studied over the last decade of learning copywriting, uh, was Andre Chaperone's autoresponder madness course. And I was looking for someone to come in and do a training for my Rainmakers. And I thought, oh my gosh, I need to reach out to, to Andre. And I, and I messaged him on Facebook. We've been friends for a while. And he goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I'm not the guy you need to meet my business partner, Sean. He's amazing. Uh, so Sean and I got connected and we had a little conversation about marketing and psychology and the training that he'll be doing next month for my Rainmakers. And I'm like, I seriously need you to come onto my YouTube channel. We need to get geek out about marketing. Some of the stuff you shared literally had like my jaw, like, oh my God, I love this. So I am just absolutely honored that you're here. And I know whatever we talk about will be magical. Yeah, Andre is a classic introvert. So, and I'm I'm not, he says I'm an extrovert. I'm not, I'm an ambivert, but he, but compared to Andre, I'm an extrovert. Um, so and we like to, and we, we've kind of convinced people that we're like, it's like Fight Club. It's like Tyler Durden. We're the same person. We just show up as different manifestations. It's not really true, but it's a good story. It's a good story. I love it. And uh, I'm just honored that you're making the time for this. Uh, Cause you're really, I mean, an OG, you, started your digital agency in 1998. So you, when it comes to marketing on the internet, you know a thing or two. And I'm really curious to hear just a little bit of your backstory of how you got in 
into this whole world of online marketing and, and that journey? Yeah, it's, I'll do the very short version just because it, it sets a little context. Um, I was a, I, I left graduate school, went to DC, got my dream job. It happened to be around the time when the internet was becoming a thing. And I was the youngest person in the place that I worked. And my boss came to me one day and said, hey, um, and, and he said, he said this with a period, but he meant a comma. He said, hey, we need a website, period. What he meant was, hey, we need a website, comma, that eventually will be 18,000 pages. And that was 18,000 pages in the, in the mid 90s. So wow. I, I had zero qualifications, but it seemed interesting. So I learned, you know, built a website that eventually was 18,000 pages. Because I knew that, um, I knew how to do that, I, I got similar jobs with other organizations sort of around the place where I worked. I just got better and better at it. And then um, my father was diagnosed with cancer. I moved back uh, to where I'm from, which is Vermont. And I had uh, two skill sets. Uh, one, I was a defense and intelligence uh, staff writer for a magazine. I knew a lot about the, the uh, Israel's ballistic missile program and Iran's wow. Navy, uh, which in back home in Vermont, not a great skill set to have. Uh, <laughs> but I also happen to have this skill set around web development. So I just hope you put, you know, put my shingle out. Um, started an agency in November 1998. I'm starting to get customers, started to get customers through word of mouth. I was too dumb. This is, and I'm not saying this with humility. I'm saying this truthfully. I was too dumb to know at the time that there was a difference between you know, building websites and getting traffic. So I just started to like whenever I would get a client, I would I would learn. You know, I was an early adopter for Google Ads, then AdWords, now Google Ads, um, and just we just I did it all. Like I'm I'm, I'm curious. So continued to build the agency, build the agency, and then eventually close the agency uh, 21 years later, uh, 22, 21 um, years later, and then joined uh, my dear friend, Andre Chaperon as a, it sort of COVID had hit. He and I had talked about doing a traffic course. I've, I've managed somewhere around a hundred million dollars in ad spend. So he, we, we had been talking for two years about doing a, a paid traffic course. COVID hit, I said, hey, let's do it. Um, we, had cons we had done some consulting together for other clients. And then, and because we wrote together, and we do, we, we, we write together, which is weird. He's six hours ahead. So um, I generally will write the base of something that he's working on it when I'm asleep. And then I get up and we work on it together. It's very odd. But that was so much fun yeah. when we did the promotion together. We said, hey, you know what? We, like a month later, we're like, we should do this more, like all the time. That was two years ago. So wow. uh, lots, lots have happened in two years. You know? Man, the number That's... of times I've talked to people that say, man, we we pivoted in, in 2020. It's like you shut down your agency of 22 years yeah. uh, and pivoted massively. But I, I mean, I absolutely love that. And I love what you said about curiosity. And I mean, that is the secret. I really do feel like oh, having I, a... Yeah an agency for 22 years, working with over 240 clients, including Agora Financial, Legacy Research, <laughs> managing over $100 million in ad spend. I mean, you've seen some things. <laughs> you've seen some things. Yeah, and that's, you know, one of my favorite, you've given me the perfect opening here so we can segue into the conversation today. I knew this would happen. We talked about this earlier. So yeah. I have this thing that I do that it's part of my curiosity. If I have an opportunity to, if I have five minutes with someone who's really good at something, like I've had this happen a lot. I'll often ask them like one or two questions. The first question I like to ask is like, if you look over the entire, entirety of your career, what do you think are the three things in your field that matter most? That's a favorite question of mine. Or um, I might ask somebody like, hey, if you, if someone who does like consulting or something like that, like, hey, what are, if you look at like the history of your entire business, all of your experience, what are the three most common state mistakes that you wish your clients would avoid? I just, I love questions like that. Mm -hmm. So when I was thinking about our conversation today, but the way I tried to frame it to myself was like, okay, I've been at this for 25 years, you know, for 240, 250 or so clients, 750 projects, 100 million in ad spend. I've written hundreds of thousands of words with Andre. We teach thousands of students. If I could just, if, if we could just talk about one thing, like if they could just, if there was just one thing that rises, is there, and, and the question to myself was, is there one thing that rises right. above everything else? You know, of course, you've got to do something, you know, there are like 20 things and there are five things and then there are two things and then you're like, oh, there is one thing. So um, by the end of this conversation, if, if I'm successful, if we really do our work well together today, the end of this conversation, I think the people who pay attention to this start to finish are going to have an understanding of that one thing that separates the 99.99% 99 
of marketers who are okay, they do well, from the 0.01 percent who who just are exceptional. Right there, there's just and I don't know. I know I, I like to say five out of four people are bad at math. I don't know the the math, but you know you've been around those people, right? You've been around the people. It's like yeah, they they kind of get it. But then you've been around the people that are like, oh, they're operating in a different world. I think the thing we're going to talk about is the thing that makes the difference. I may be wrong. You know, so other people may have different opinions. This is just one guy's opinion. Um, you know, it's an opinion informed by a little bit of experience, but it's, it's one guy's opinion. But that's that's the goal for today to tell you to get your audience to to know what I think is the one thing that separates good marketers from exceptional marketers. So let's set the bar there and see what happens. Like I said earlier, <laughs> yeah, hold on, I want to try something. Good. Yeah, I let's, think that let's, let's try something. Amazing. Yeah, exactly. Well, and the thing I love that you said, and it's so true, you know, all the tactics, all the strategies, all of that stuff in marketing is cool. I mean, of course, right? We all want to learn the formulas, the, you know, the triggers, the, the tricks, the tactics, the exercises, all those buzzwords. Um, but when it comes to great marketing, I feel like you can tell, you know, you're like, okay, this person gets it. And part of that is curiosity, like we talked about earlier. Um, but I love that. And, and I'm, yeah, I'm so, I'm so excited to, to have this conversation because, and, and you said this earlier, you know, we're going to, we're going to condense your decades of experience, <laughs> like decades into one YouTube video. And I'm not lying. You guys, this is the kind of shit that people spend I don't think I can swear on YouTube. YouTube, cut that out so that you don't hurt my organic reach. <laughs> um, <laughs> Whoops. Yeah, whoopsies. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that people pay a lot of money for. And the fact that, I mean, you're here doing this training for free for my Posse community. I can only imagine the talk that you're giving next month for my Rainmakers, but I am excited. I am here both as a student and fellow <laughs> marketing enthusiast and we're just going to geek out on all things marketing today. And Sweet. if, yeah, if you guys watching are stoked, give a thumbs up, comment below. Um, this is going to be awesome. I, and, and let's be honest, everybody wants a posse. That's why I'm here. I just, it's just the coolest thing ever. You're in, you're in. Okay. Sweet. I'm so excited now. All right. So let's, let's start with some of the, some of the obvious, right? We'll just, we'll go through a little obvious and we'll kind of go on some tangents, but the obvious thing, the critical ingredient we have to start with is, is excitement. We, we all know that everyone's like, yep, okay, this guy's an idiot. That we're, I just wasted my time because he said blinding flash in the obvious. But we we start from the perspective of we want our prospects to be excited about what we're talking with them about. That's that's the critical ingredient. And the cool thing about is about excitement is we can reverse engineer it. Like we kind of know the ingredients of excitement. And rather than you know go through a, a ten hour lecture on how to do that, I'm just I'm going to direct people to someone who uh, really opened my eyes to it. His name is Robert Fritz. And a really weird story. I read his books. I was so I was just stunned. I'm like this guy. The, um, the two books. One is Your Life Is Art, and the other is I can't remember the name, and I will in a minute. Um, but the when I read the books, I was like. Yes, like this is it. But the weird part about the story is I, I reached out to him on Facebook and I was like, just so wanted to thank him for how much, like how much sense he had made to me. And I realized he lives like an hour from me. I'm like, how weird is that? And I live in the middle of nowhere. So I was like, how weird is that? So anyway, Robert Fritz, he has, um, he's condensed a lot of creativity down into this idea of structural tension. And we don't need to get into all the details, but what the, the way he describes it in a way that's really interesting for our purposes on mar in marketing is that we think about the progression from an A to a B. The A is where our audience is right now, wherever right now is for the audience that you're engaging with, that's A. But we're taking them someplace, that's B. And the, the tension exists between those two things. Right now, let's, let's just do a quick example so we know. Um, if I, if you and I were talking about Star Wars, the movie, and we, I was like, hey, by the way, Alex, here's the thing. Uh, Darth Vader's Luke, Luke Skywalker's father. And like, I, I told you all the things, right? You'd be like, what? Yeah. Like, there's no tension anymore, right? Because the, the, the thing that's drawing us forward is the story. And there are all these things we don't know. And that tension, we feel it. We're glued to the screen. We're at the edge of our seat. Mm -hmm. And... The first thing I like to think about when I sit down to write or to create at all is where am I meeting my audience right now? And then where am I taking them? 
and this exists on really lots of time scales. So this is the important thing. There, there is a time scale of like within a piece of content, like within an email, there's a tension from paragraph to paragraph from beginning to end. There's a, a time scale from one email to the next if you're doing multiple, uh, a multiple email campaign. But all of that might exist within this much larger narrative arc. That might be a Facebook ad that frames a certain way to see the world. And then there's a landing page that continues the frame and sort of builds out um, a larger understanding of it. And then you might get to an opt-in page and then an email that they you know, maybe say seven emails. And maybe after seven or eight emails, you begin to talk about this offer that you have and you transition to that. That's one long A to B journey. And within that A to B journey are all these other little A to B journeys. And the way I think about it is like a staircase, right? The staircase is going up and there's, there's tension that's created and resolved a little, but never too much and a little more and never too much. And we're, we're continuing to use that tension to pull people forward. Now let's compare that to the, I love this alternative because it just makes me laugh every time I think about this. I used to read my daughter a book uh, when she was little. <laughs> and the book is called, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie. And what the book is about is if you give a mouse a cookie, the mouse, gonna, the, he's going to want a glass of milk. And then when he wants a glass of milk, he wants this other thing. When he wants the other thing, and the whole book is about what he wants next until the thing that he wants next, he wants another cookie, right? Circular, right? <laughs> this is every email I've ever read ever, which is like, hey, there's this story. And let me tell you a little bit of story. And oh, by the way, I have this thing to sell. It, all over and over and over and tomorrow. Oh yeah, this thing happened to me. It reminded me of this thing. And, oh, by the way, I have this thing. To sell. Right. There's no tension. Every yeah. day you're you're just you're telling me a story and you're you're resolving the tension. So after two or three stories, I don't I don't care anymore. Yeah. Right? You're not pulling my attention forward. You haven't captured. You just haven't done it. I think I'm going to create a book. It's like you know, if you give a market or a story, right? We've all heard this over and over. Oh, just use story. Yeah. That's such an incomplete piece of advice it's the tension mm. of story that we want it's the larger tension that's pulling us forward but it's the micro tensions the unresolved you know ideas the like the implicit ideas the explicit things that you say i had this happen to me i'll, I'll give everyone an example so they know what it feels like and it still drives me crazy tim ferris interviewed someone named safi bakal really fascinating guy safi bakal in the interview said he has these three writing frameworks and then he, in each framework had some number of parts. And then Tim Ferriss, because apparently he hates me, kept interrupting him. And Safi Bacall never, like he, he, kind of, he filled in like some details for two of them completely, but there were details that he didn't fill in. It drives me crazy. This was two years ago, three years ago. Still drives me crazy. I have personally emailed, I've tracked down Safi Bacall's personal email address. <laughs> I've sent him emails. I've essentially begged and pleaded, like, could you, I was like, will you write a book? And anything, anything yeah. to close the loop. And of mm -hmm. course, he's busy. He's not going to do it, right? But think about it. Three years, this guy's maintained my attention because he hasn't closed the tension he created with me. That's what we're, that's, that's the wow. first idea we're going through. Oh all my right, gosh. so fire questions at me about this. Yeah, so much of what you said, I mean, first of all, I've never in all of my years of marketing heard it called tension. And that, I feel like it makes sense. It's that, like that anticipation that what, what, what? Like pull, pull me in because I need to know what's gonna happen next. And, you know, we've heard, like you said, use story, use open loops. I mean, I teach all of that, but I love that you said like the difference between, you know, seeing an email from someone and they go, let me tell you a story now, buy my stuff. <laughs> and like, you can see like, yeah, yeah, they, they get it, but they, they don't quite get it. Like they're doing right. all of the right things. They're using the formulas, the whatever, the templates, but they're not understanding that concept of tension. And I, I freaking love the idea of micro tension. Cause you could like, I think of, you know, like you said, from every sentence to sentence, you want to create that pull effect of someone just continuing to read. And of course there's lots of ways to do that, but then even the tension that happens from an ad to a landing page or an email to a sales page. And then you could probably even take that higher and think, 
ultimately, where are you helping people get to as their like kind of ideal end state? And that tension could be pulled through an, an entire product suite from, you know, the first time someone ever comes across your brand, the very first touch point, all the way up to being your your highest, most loyal customer who buys everything from you and has you know completely transformed their life and business as a result, whatever it is that you're selling. And to me, that's just so powerful because it it all of a sudden becomes like inception of the open loops. It's not just <laughs> right. about like an open loop followed by an open loop followed by an open loop. It's like all of these open loops in one giant open loop. And I mean, what? my mind is already blown. We could end here probably. <laughs> yeah, easy enough. But we wouldn't have delivered on the promise though. So here's the, oh, we made a promise in the beginning. What an Did interesting we? idea. Oh. Um, here and here's the seat. So I know a lot of people who are watching this are like, okay, great, that, that sounds fine, but like, what do you actually do? And, and this is the key right. to understanding tension. And, and it's it, as soon as I say it, it's going to be so obvious. And I can see everyone's just gonna, I, it was a head slapping moment for me where I was like, I can't believe I didn't see this. The, the, the superpower, the first superpower you have, this isn't the like big superpower, but this is like the, the micro superpower. The superpower that we have as marketers when we think about structural attention and pulling our audience's attention forward is we know where they're going and they don't. That's, that's the core thing to understand. If I want to take you on a journey where, and Andre and I did this last fall, we had this, um, we have a course that talks about the way we do our personal knowledge management called Ideas to Assets. And when we, the email campaign for it was about alchemy and this idea of transmuting lead into gold and this cipher had been discovered and it was this fascinating story. But we knew, and our audience knew too, that we weren't hiding it, but we knew that on third, we started the campaign on Monday we knew on Thursday they could. there was a thing that they could buy and we wanted them to have a certain uh, set of emotions and excitement and we, were, we knew that and we knew what we were going to reveal and all the things it did, but they didn't. So of course we could engineer surprise and mystery and novelty and all of like, there's so much we could do simply because we know where they're going and our audience doesn't. And how often is that true for all of us as marketers? And how often do we forget that we're taking somebody on a journey where we know where we're going and they don't. And what a what a beautiful way to make something exciting for somebody, right? Instead of being like, oh yeah, there's this thing. I, my, I met my buddy the other day and we did this thing. And yeah, here's my stuff, buy it. Right? Instead of doing that, think about like, what's exciting about the thing that you're going to offer them? Maybe don't offer it to them today, right? Maybe that's part of the excitement. Maybe the story is in parts. And it's the building, it's the coming together of those parts that makes more sense that when they all come together, the tension that resolves is in the direction of the thing that you sell. That may make more sense. And, and you know, marketers everywhere are like, oh my God, wait, what? Like, don't try to sell in the first email? Right. What a novel idea. Andre and I never sell in the first email, ever. Yeah. It's days. And we have people literally reaching out. We have an email on our site. Um, we have like 250, 300,000 words of free content on our site and our emails that we've written in our campaigns. But we have um, we have one of them where, and this happens a lot, but this Landon is the first guy who, who we just, we love Landon because he, he was so emphatic about it. We were on day three of a promotion and he just sent us an email and said, dudes, take my money. <laughs> Like he was so frustrated and link? we get people doing this all the time that will send us emails and they will be like, will you please take my money? Like that's what we're trying to, that that's what we're trying to get for a feeling for our audience. So, um, okay, let's, okay. let's do this. Let's go through, actually, I want to, I want to do one more thing and then we'll transition to some questions. I want to give your audience like the, I want to condense how to how this feels into one resource they can go look at we'll put this i think we can put this in the show notes but okay. you can also find it easy search if you search for uh, ben zander b-e-n-z-a-n-d-e-r ted talk uh, i think it's one of the top 10 ted talks of all times ben zander was the conductor for the boss or maybe he is the conductor for the boston philharmonic mm. don't let the title of the ted talk put you off it's about it's something about classical music i'm not a classical music person but what he does in the, the ted talk is gorgeous stunning but there's a part of the ted talk where he plays chopin and and he explains why it's so moving and what the song does is the tension grows 
but but it doesn't quite resolve it grows you'll know this i won't give it away you'll know the song as soon as he plays it but what the song is doing is it's progressing but instead of hitting the note we expect he hits a different variation of the note and you're like hmm. and then he does it again and he goes up and then the note it's not quite right and you can see the people in the audience and, and ben zander as he's playing it he's telling like you can feel it's not quite right but then when the song ends he plays it through in the note that you are expecting to hear that resolves the tension of the song when he plays it it flashes to the audience and everybody in the audience goes oh right <laughs> that's what we're trying to do right when somebody when you take somebody when when they arrive at that destination you want it to feel like oh right like whatever it is whatever market whatever campaign whatever it is they feel like they're home Yeah. Right? That, that finally somebody understands them. Finally, it's, it all makes sense. The reason that they try, the reason they've tried to get this result in the past and didn't, now they know why. The reason they have hope for the future, now they understand why. Like all of it comes together and feels like what we feel like when we sit in our favorite chair or we see our best friend or um, we've all had that experience. We're like we've had a crazy day or whatever. You look up and like the person you you most hope to see is there and you're like oh like everything's great now that's what we're doing as marketers that's what we're reverse engineering okay fire away uh, questions i'm getting oh my gosh here. oh this is also exciting first of all when you said ben zander i'm like why do i know that name i've written a a book i think that he's written called the art of possibility yeah, if i'm well, remembering it's right there hold on <laughs> Oh. Do I have it on my shelf too? Somewhere I have. Yeah, it. here we go. The Art There of Possibility. I love this book. Yes, love it. I highly recommend everyone read that. I may have recommended it before, but amazing book. And and as soon as you said that he was a a film harmonic or like a conductor or whatever, I'm like, oh my gosh, I have read that book. Yeah. Okay. Oh my god. Okay, Alex, calm down. What do we need to talk about? <laughs> so, firstly, I freaking love how much you love marketing. And I know we geeked out on this the first time that we connected <laughs> because I freaking love marketing and not in the I'm going to I'm going to make a million bazillion dollars and drive a Lambo and you know make a whole bunch of money and people are going to buy my stuff kind of way. I love marketing because it is truly how you become influential, how you persuade people, how you make a difference in the world. And as marketers, we have this incredible superpower to be able to inspire action through the power of our words. And if everyone did marketing in the way that you are explaining, in the way that I deep in my bones believe it should be done, I truly believe like we can change the face of marketing so that it doesn't feel icky or douchey or scammy or, you know, and actually is empowering. And that's just to hear you say, you like to share your definition of marketing gets me really excited because it is literally the backbone of my entire mission at the Posse. So I know the Posse is going to love you <laughs> um, for that. And the fact that you're talking about sort of not selling in the first email, again, it's like, you know, unpopular opinion probably in a lot of direct response marketing circles because it's all about like, you get the lead, you sell. You get the lead, you sell. They're either going to buy or they're, they're going to unsubscribe. And I've sort of built my whole business on this idea that I don't want someone to come and then leave. I want someone to come and be like, oh my gosh, I have found my my people. Exactly. This is where I want to hang out. You know, seeing your best friend walk in the door and being able to trickle that into everything you do. So I freaking love that you said that. And so I'm really curious, like this idea of reverse engineering is absolutely something that I think about a lot. You know, I can think of sort of the end vision of what it is that I'm trying to create. And It is such a powerful idea because I think so many people go into marketing, maybe even just thinking of the next, like the next step. Okay, I need to get someone to click this link, which I, of course is important, right? We want a call to action. We want people to take action on whatever it is that we're asking them to do. But this idea of reverse engineering is just so powerful because you can literally, it's not just reverse engineering sort of one product launch. It, it can be reverse engineering ultimately your entire business so that every single thing you do and every single marketing effort you put out there is sort of feeding this ecosystem, this machine that you're building um, of marketing. And so I'm curious from a more 
just strategic tactical standpoint, when you and Andre are sitting down to map out a launch or to do a product and you know that you have a bunch of messaging to create, is there a process that you go through in order to sort of reverse engineer, but then also breadcrumb that excitement to be like, okay, we're gonna talk about this here, then this, is, is there any sort of kind of creative process that you follow? There is, and there is, and the thing to be, you know, aware of for both Andre and me, we, between us, we've got more than four decades of experience. So most of what we do is unconscious confidence. We just, right. we just do it. Yeah. But there's some things that we do that I'll talk about the things that I do specifically. It'll be not more fair to Andre. So what the first thing that I do when I, when I doesn't matter if I'm writing a single email, it doesn't matter. doesn't matter what I'm writing. The first thing I write down, I, I, I write uh, with pencil. Um, I'm, in love, I'm a pencil dork. I'm in love with black wing pencils and, um, and I'm a pen dork. I'm just a dork. We'll just leave it at that. So, um, so I will write down what and I'll draw an, a box with an A in it and a B in it. And I want to know what's my A to B here. First thing I want to know where where do I think my audience is? Where like, and this is just this this isn't this isn't sophisticated. I just want to make sure I understand. You know, if it's if it's email three in a series or whatever it is, I just I want to have a sense where are they. But then what's the what's the B? Like what's B, where am I taking them? Because then I really, I ask the question that is, <laughs> this is a really weird experience for me because I do it to myself, but then I will ask, I'll come up with something that I think is the point of like the, the main message of that email. And then I write, who cares? And that in the first two cares is sort of neutral. I'm like, oh, then I, I write an answer to it. And then immediately after I write, who cares again? Now I'm a little irritated. Right, because that it, there's a little energy in that where they, you know one the, what this one idiot in my head is asking the other chimp in my head who cares a little too often, and I'll do that until I get really frustrated and like and I write something and I'm like oh that's that's actually the thing that I'm talking about and it's like that it's uncovering it and what I'm trying to find is I'm like what is the thing that actually matters here we did this with a series I'll just give you a real example so people understand what this is we did this with a series last year and we did this as uh, Andre and I did it as dialogue where he and I, I was like I was like what do you think the theme is like like what, what is you know, he had an idea and I'm like I had an idea and both ideas sucked and then th then we kind of looked at it and, and and at some point, one of us was like, you know, it's just, it's pride. It's just, people just want to feel pride. And we were both like, oh, right. Like, as soon as we heard the word, we're like, this entire campaign is about the pride of being able to accomplish something and the pride of looking at the people who you care about in the eye and knowing you did the thing that mattered. Like, whatever that is, like, that's what it was. And as soon as we had that word, as soon as we had that, we we could do the entire campaign wrote itself and the first and it was that was a great campaign the first email that went out immediately and because we set it up we framed the whole thing that this is about pride and pride's not a bad thing pride can be a bad thing it's one of the seven deadly sins but pride can be a good thing and we gave some examples you know what does it feel like when you have made uh you know a certain amount of money that takes care of things that are important to your family. It doesn't need to be the Lambo in the driveway, right? That's Grant Cardone's thing, he can have it. Um, or maybe, it's, no, it's Ty Lopez. Ty Lopez can have the, the Lambos. They have it. I'm a German guy, I'm a Porsche. Um, like, but, but what does it feel like? What does it really feel like when you're, the people in your life who you care about look at you and think like, he, this is important. Like as soon as we dialed in on that, the emails that we got in response were shocking. I mean, people were just, like the things that people shared with us and i realized like whoa we 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 hit something here and to your earlier point i want to clarify this i, I recognize myself professionally as a marketer and i love marketing i think about marketing but i never really think about it being marketing right but I, you know for me what i think about is that there are people in this world whose lives could change sometimes just a little bit but sometimes a lot because of things that other people know or know how to do or whatever. And to, to put those two things together, to show another human being that they can do things that they don't realize they can do. Yes. And, and to, to make that connection in a way that's genuine and caring and never grow. Like, I don't, I don't want, I never, I don't sell. Like that's my, you know, it's the whole Peter Drucker thing. The art, the whole point of, whole point of marketing is to make selling superfluous. 
it, 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 like if, if I have to sell something, I've done something terribly wrong. What I like to think about is how do I make this the obvious, how do I make the, the yeah. thing to buy the obvious next step for the person who needs it now? And it's the right solution. How do I make that obvious to, the, to everyone? So that yeah. they know, there's no doubt, they're like, this is the thing for me. If I do that, I've done like, and that's, I get it, that's marketing, but anyway. Yeah. So I sort yeah. of on a tangent there, no. but that's our, that's kind of our process. Like, who <laughs> cares? Love, Ask I yourself that. that over again. Yeah. And don't be satisfied until you get mad. Yeah. Like, you have to be genuinely mad at yourself or you're irritated. You're like, oh, and then you're like, oh, oh, it's that, like that. And then you just go back and yeah. start with that. So. Yeah, I'll, t- I'll tell you actually this perfect example of what you're saying. Because again, right, it's really easy to, and I I feel like this happens a lot in sales, copywriting, writing sales emails, where you're like, okay, I have this new thing, I wanna sell it. So I have a list or whatever, and I'm gonna send some emails. And it's really easy to fall back on the very logical left brain stuff, right? Like, look at all the value you get, and it's only for this much. you know, yes, having a great offer and a good deal obviously is part of marketing. Like you you want people to feel like, oh my gosh, yes, that's a no brainer. However, I feel like so many people skip over what you were talking about, which what I it'd be what I call like values-based marketing. You know, when I'm selling a program, telling people, hey, I'm gonna teach you how to become a copywriter and ignite your business. What do people really care about? So it's really that 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 who cares question and even like they want to make a lot of money okay why you know why what is the underlying values the driving force behind behind this and the second you can get so clear on why your audience what would make this such a no-brainer next step for your audience and it's speaking to their values so that they feel so heard so understood uh and this happened last year i was launching a high ticket membership program and I had someone on my team help me with writing the sales emails and she did a great job, but you know, she was focusing very much on uh, sort of what we typically do with some of our lower ticket offers. So, you know, playing up the, the scarcity, the price, the value price gap, all of that stuff. And we sent out a few emails and, and you know, a couple of people had joined. And I remember sitting and looking at these emails going, they're great, they're good sales emails, but what's holding people back has nothing to do with the scarcity, the value, the price. There's something else and really getting clear on what, what that A to B look like, you know, what, where are they now? What are their fears? I mean, truly just spending some time thinking about what is holding them back. What are they worried about? What are they, you know, what, this is the thing that marketers miss too, is, is what you just described is we we're really good at explaining how the thing that we've created can get this incredible result. But, it, and, and we go to, you know, we, we, we do all the things to show how it makes perfect sense. But the thing that we forget is that they don't have any doubt that we can do it. They have the, the doubt exactly. that they have is that they can do it. Yeah. Um, and that's the emotional piece, right? To speak to somebody and say, listen, I, I got these results and you won't, you won't likely get the same results on day one. That's just true. But if you're willing to like say there's three things they need to do, if you're willing to show up and do these three things consistently, then there's nothing between you and what you want other than time and commitment. And, and you're being honest, but you're, it's the, the, the hurdle. And, and everybody forgets this is everybody kind of comes in and shows up to say like, you know, I've done this thing and I've created, I put so much value in it. It's like, you're not the one they're worried about. They're worried about, can they do it? Right. Yeah. And that's, that's often the difference between a, a good promotion and an extraordinary promotion is the one that speaks to what the audience is deeply fearful about. Yeah. And no one, and we don't know this. Like if, if you pull your audience, like what are your biggest fears? No one, yeah. it, it's hard to say, well, you know, at the end of the day, my biggest fear is that I'm not good enough yeah. and I can't do this. And it like, that that's a that's a fear that we don't just bring to the cocktail party right and let it and we may not even know that yeah Um, but when you do it for them i mean this is the essence of i think the brilliance of what donald miller got so right with story brand is that the the meeting of the hero and the guide begins with empathy then authority and what marketers tend to jump to is they skip empathy go right to authority 
They're like, hey, look at me, I'm so smart. And my dad, my dad was a lifelong martial artist and he, when I was uh, in fifth grade, there was a, we were at a tournament and a guy had just got um, the title of master. And when you, when that happens, people have called you Mr. or Miss or Mrs. for 20 years. And then the day your title changes, people haven't quite caught up. So my dad, this guy had just become master and he, he was so mad everyone kept calling him Mr. He jumped up on a table, he was wagging his finger. And he said, my title is master. I won't say his name, not Mr. You should address me. And my dad, I remember this, I was, you know, this was a long time ago, it was fifth grade. My dad looked at me and he said, you're gonna meet two types of people in your life. People who demand your respect like that guy and people who command your respect, mm -hmm. right? Good marketers command people's respect because we never ask for it. We meet our audience with empathy. We under we we have the ability to say, listen, we can you know, implicitly, explicitly, I, I have a sense of what this feels like to you. So let me, before we do anything else, before I tell you about me, before I tell you how great this thing is, why don't you and I make sure we understand each other? And I'm gonna take you through what it felt like for me when I was where you are. And let's see if that sinks up a little bit. And then if it does, I'll tell you about when I look back on it, where I was right, where I was wrong, where I needed help, where I needed, like, I'll take you on that journey. Michael Pollan talks about this when he writes, that he doesn't want to be the, the, the brilliant guy up front telling you how to do things. He, he goes on journeys and then he just takes people on the journey that he went on with them. And I'm like, that, that to me is good marketing. Like, I want to go do cool stuff. And I'm like, hey, Let's go, let's go do this together. I, I'm maybe a little farther ahead, but I wanna show you like what I found. Like, let's go, let's go have fun. There's something about that that's just so profoundly different. Oh, I do I love marketing. Good. Every time I talk about it, I realize yeah. I love it even more. And I think too, it's like, we say we love marketing and it's, it's cause it's for everything that you're just saying now, you know? And I think a lot of people, and I'll even get this from some of my students where they'll join, they'll join the posse and they'll go, you know, finally someone who's talking about, um, selling in a way that doesn't feel like icky, you know, and, a, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of resistance to selling and I love selling and I'm always like, whoa, 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 no, don't get me wrong. I love I love selling as long as we're selling products and services that genuinely help people because I really do believe that like this is our superpower and we can help people absolutely change their lives and believe in themselves and empathy is that thing that it's a buzzword a lot of people talk about it but again going back to what we said earlier not selling in the first email if all you did in the beginning of a of a leads you know new relationship with you and your brand if all you did was focus on understanding who they are you are going to sell so much more and you right. don't have to do any of like you know the bells and whistles and any of that because like you said you're not you're not actually even selling you're meeting them where they are at and then you're saying come on let's go <laughs> i found this really cool right. thing like are you with me or are you right. not and then it almost feels like an adventure and it's this really beautiful um it's this really beautiful like hey you're you can come along i know that you'll you know when you're ready you'll make the decision and that's all of a sudden changes the entire dynamic of a sales relationship and again unpopular opinion but i you know truly believe that that's how you get customers for life you know and this is in, i'm so glad you said this because this is this is an unpopular opinion that's so ridiculously misinformed that it's laughable. Mm -hmm. So Dean Jackson has said this publicly, and if, I assume everybody listening knows who Dean is. Dean is truly the OG of internet marketing, Maybe, an OG yeah. of internet marketing. Brilliant guy, kind. Um, I don't, don't want to be very clear, I don't know Dean personally, but Dean and I were um, at a speaker's, we were, we were sitting next to each other at a speaker's dinner before, uh, I think it's before Copy Chief Live, um, 2019, I think. But we're talking to each other, and this, and Dean shared this with me in person, and I've since verified he shared it publicly. So, and Andre and I refer to this all the time. Dean has looked at extensive data for his clients, and he works with lots of big clients. I've had this conversation with more marketers than I care to even count. We've had more of our clients come back, our, our students come back and verify this. So I believe this is as true in our world as gravity. And here's, here's the thing that Dean talks about. When he looks at the data for large segments of buyers, of the people who buy from somebody in two years, right? Buyers, not leads. People who buy in two years, only 15% buy in the first 90 days. 15%. Like, let that sink in. There's four times the revenue opportunity after 90 days if you don't screw things up. 
yeah. right? So this idea, and this is the most, this is the most misinformed idea in marketing of all, which is that if you don't sell right now, you won't get the opportunity. Yeah. It, it's so, it's so misinformed. It's laughable. Yet everybody then reverse it. Like everybody then adapts what they do to like, well, if I don't sell to them right now, they won't buy from me. And it's like, you're optimizing for, for a tiny, when you do that, you're optimizing for the tiny slice of people who would buy from you over two years if you just let them buy when they want to buy. Yeah. Um, and, and Andre and I really have, we have reformulated our entire philosophy of marketing around purchases being an emergent property of relationships or systems theorists, which means, and it's similar to what you were talking about before with money. We don't, we never think about money. We never think about like, how much is this promotion going to make? Or what we think about is, how are we going to create the most value for our audience, both for the people who don't buy anything? Uh, so there's value in just seeing what we do. There's value, there's informative value. Like we want it to be interesting. There's entertainment value. There's, there's value for everybody. But we know that the money will be an emergent property. It will, it's not something that you actually make. It's something that happens as a result of all the other things. And, and good marketing the, the sales that happen are an emergent property of the relationship you build with your audience. Mm -hmm. Like that's a critical insight. And if you just focus on the relationship, the sales will actually take care of themselves. But if you just focus on the sales, you're really going to have a hard time building the relationship because it feels kind of funky if the relationship is all about, hey, remember that story I told you yesterday? You want to buy that thing? Like that just gets so old. Totally. It's so, so old. It reminds me. All right, me we, of... have, we have to deliver on a promise here pretty soon. So, all right. Oh, yeah. I go... Interrupt you there. One more comment and then and then we'll deliver on the promise. Um, it reminds me of, I was chatting with Brian Kurtz uh, a couple of weeks ago and it, it's this whole idea around like, lists are people too. Like, we, right. it's so easy to, you know, as a marketer, look at your email list and you see numbers and percentages and then you realize on the other end of that is like a real living breathing human being who for a split second thought you were worthy enough of their email address and gave you permission to contact them now how are you going to build that relationship and it's so mind-blowing to me the the different philosophy sort of around what you said and about oh hey let's get the sale right away and a lot of marketing tools and and systems have been built with that mentality like you look at you know cold you know facebook advertising things like that you know oh the pixel expires and then we don't actually know we can't track and and i feel like everything has been geared towards like no it's all about the immediate sale the immediate gratification and if instead you look back and go okay Everything I produce is gonna be valuable in and of itself. And that's my philosophy. I don't care if anyone ever buys from me. I want every single interaction that they have with the posse to leave them feeling uplifted, entertained, informed, uh, or even just, you know, like have a warm feeling because the content, you know, provided some sort of uh, value in that way. And, and I truly believe that if that becomes sort of the maximum of how we as marketers show up, then the internet is just going to be a way better place to hang out <laughs> and right. and truly like we can change the face of marketing with that philosophy yeah and it's wouldn't it you can you imagine if more people did this how much fun would it be yeah. something you just said made me think of an example that just to put a, a fine point on it um this idea of people versus you know lists or names or whatever we had a i can't remember exactly when this was it was months ago um, but we had somebody reach out to us who it's like, listen, I want to, I want to buy your course. Um, could you like, like essentially he's like, could you, you know, and he said, I want to buy your course. Uh, and he'd been, he'd done all of our free courses. We have tons of free courses, tons of free content. He'd gone through everything. He'd done the work and he said, but, and, and he said, I want to pay for it, but could you give me a payment plan that was like way longer? And, you know, and Andre and I, we, we get these requests a lot, but and this one, something about this one stood out. And, and the guy was just, he, was, he had done the work. Mm -hmm. So we were looking at, we were like back and forth. And, and so we, we can't, we, we reached the decision. We said, you know what, we're, we're not going to do that. We're going to, we're going to give him the course. And we said, and, he, and we kind of said, here's what we want you to do. We're giving it to you, go do it. You make your first hundred thousand dollars, come back, buy the course. Like that's what we want you to do. But we want you to, it was just, and we don't do this all the time. It's just one particular person. Three weeks later, 
Russia invaded Ukraine. That gentleman lived in Kyiv. He's Ukrainian. Wow. So now we had this moment where it, it, both of like someone on our support team, I think, said something, but all of a sudden, all of us, uh, you know, Andre, me, Nick, others in the support were like, wait a minute, we need to go make sure he's okay. Like there was, he's a real person. Right? Mm -hmm. Everyone who, when the transaction comes through, the league comes through, there's a real person. And, and I use this example just because you, you can you can feel what it's like to realize like, wow, had we had we handled that differently, and I'm not saying we're perfect by any means, but had we handled that differently, it would have felt way different. But to to recognize this is a person, everybody's a person, and to try to, to always have that approach, um, it sounds like it's really hard. It's not hard. It's so much easier than the alternative. You know, the the the, the trying to maintain the facade of being you know, somehow a genius above it all. It's a, this is actually another idea from um, from Robert Fritz that you know when someone puts you on a pedestal, there's only one direction to go, right? That's down, right? So like we don't want it's not what we want our audience. To do. It's like don't, it's not about being up here on a pedestal. It's like being shoulder to shoulder. Yeah. Like let's like yes, you have experience your audience doesn't have that you can share with them, but you're not sharing it from the perspective of hey look at me you're sharing it from the pers perspective of hey we can change this thing that's kind of broken together let's roll up our sleeves get to work like that there's something beautiful okay two things before we wrap up we need to we need to give away the big promise here can't forget that but i, I want i want to give people a way to think about how to do this because this is the question people come up with and this is what you and i in, in your uh, rainmakers are going to spend hours going into the, the minutia of how to do this which i'm super excited i'm so ridiculously <laughs> excited about the, the how but for everyone else who's like well how, like how do you actually do this the way to think about improving your marketing communication is to just look at principles of serialized narratives that's where to start shows like lost shows like 24 two of my favorite yellowstone and justified i binge watched all of justified it was so good like you'll see these things that, that we've been talking about like go watch justified it's immediately there's tension because you have the main character raylan givens as a u.s deputy marshal who goes back home where his friend is an outlaw what is that it's tension it's tension that sustains 78 episodes of the show because there's you're always like how is that going to work itself out and then of in, in justify there's also a woman that both of them care about more tension right it propels the show and when you watch because you can you can see that you don't have to wait for the episode oh, that's kind of fun you can actually see how the tension within a series how it builds and builds and builds and then resolves at the end of the, of the series and then the next and what's crazy is the next season it's the exact same formula yet you're on the yeah. edge of your seat to see how it resolves so this is learnable these skills are learnable i mean you okay can shall read. we sorry promise no. and we'll get to the promise in just a second uh, we're really we're, we're want, awful want, i want, want to say one thing first of all i knew that watching TV was the secret to being a good marketer. And second, <laughs> you could even just read the like descriptions of each episode through a series, which would be such a cool exercise just to see how they're building tension and opening loops in each of the descriptions of each episode. That would be such a cool exercise to do is just go and then, and then reverse engineer it and watch the series and see how that plays out. Absolutely. And you know what, this is what some people will do though with this, like, oh, I gotta go learn screenwriting. It's like, don't right. worry about that. Yeah. Go, go, go watch, go find a show that you like, whatever it is, that's serialized, that there's, you know, they're episode by episode, you're pulled through and season by season, you're pulled through, but, but feel it. And then, and start to ask you like, like, what's going on here? And you're like, oh, well, at the beginning of the episode, there was a scene that hinted at like, whatever, there was a gun, you know, that's, there's the old saying, if there's a gun in act one, someone gets killed in act, act two, right? Or act three, whatever. Like, you start to see all these things and then it shows up in our writing, right? One way that Andre and I do this a lot, <laughs> a lot, um, is with Easter eggs, right? So an Easter egg for anyone who's not familiar with the term is um, you, you do something that's not explicit. You don't say what it is that you're doing, but if you get a little distance and you kind of look at either an individual email or a campaign, you see that there are things happening. It's like subtext. You and I actually, there's a huge Easter egg in our conversation today that we haven't, we didn't hint at it earlier, but we'll kind of let people know that when they see it, they're going to go, 
oh, like that's, and that's a fun, uh, most of what we're doing as writers is dopamine management, right? Little squirts of dopamine or like, hey, there's a little tension and it was resolved, but not fully. And there's a little more and we're just constant little dopamine management. Dopamine. That's the takeaway. Yes. Little... <laughs> that's the that's the that's the intro for me. How to get squirts of dopamine. Andre and I use that phrase all the time. It's all about it. and the funny thing, we open loop each other all the time. We're so miserable. Just so <laughs> miserable. Okay. Shall we reveal the big secret? We It'd be terrible if we were like, ah, sorry. You, gotta, you know what? No, you let's just end up. it. Let's just, I mean, yeah. just bounce. We're out of time. Yeah, we'll talk about it some other time. This has been great. Thanks, Alex. See you. <laughs> Bye, Coffee Posse. <Bye. laughs> All right. That wouldn't be very kind. So here's the superpower. And again, one guy's opinion. If I look across, I, and I want to be clear, when I, when I say, you know, 750 plus projects, everything else, it's, they didn't all work, right? I've seen you know, the, the, the numbers I've heard a lot are 10 to 15% of offers do spectacular, 10 to 15% of offers fail spectacularly. And then in the middle are sort of, who knows, like maybe they can be salvaged, maybe you can do some optimization or whatever. So in my experience, those numbers hold true. And what I generally tell people, when I look back on my entire career, at least half of the offers that I worked on failed, not me personally, but working with clients, offers generally fail. So I'm not suggesting um, that this observation is like, it just always works. But what this observation for me is, if I, if I strip away everything else, and if I could find like the one thing that makes the difference. So if I look at all the offers that did really well, in, in, or campaigns that did really well, or where things were not like incrementally better, they were like, exponentially better. I think what the superpower is, is the ability to sustain and amplify attention. That's the superpower. And somebody listening to this is going, well, you've got to capture it first. Yes, we know. You have to, ca you have to get somebody's attention first. But what the mistake that gets made a lot is people get really good at curiosity driven attention getting, the big idea headlines, the, like all that stuff's been covered. But when the, the curiosity fades, the 100,000 leads you got aren't worth nine cents total, right? It's not the getting of attention. It's, and it's not just sustaining attention, pulling it forward, right? Rather than having to push somebody from ad to landing, being like, push it, like, please read the next email. Please read my next story about the thing I wanna sell you. Instead, we're, it's like an invisible force is pulling them. It's that sustained pulling, but also the ability when you want to, to turn up the tension, right? You're like in service to something. They're like, hey, if you're interested in X, raise your hand because we got something we're gonna do that's a, like whatever. And some people raise their hand and then you take them on a journey and then it's just tension. Like you're amping it up and then you resolve it in service of something that's beneficial to them and others. So again, one person's opinion, sustain, you know, distill everything I've learned down. If I could only, if I only could take one skill set with me into the next half of my career, it would be the ability to sustain and amplify attention. So that's the, that's the big secret, I think. I freaking love it. And it's so, I mean, it's so true. I, I'll i often hear people say, oh, people's attention spans are like, they're nothing now. And I'm like, no, no, no. How many of us sit in front of Netflix for hours on end watching a show until it says, are you still watching? And you're like, yes, I'm still watching Netflix. <laughs> and so I don't think people's attention spans have gotten shorter. What's happened is the the availability of high quality content where people can just go elsewhere. So how are you going to show up and deliver once you keep, keep or capture that attention? Uh, because to me, yeah, capturing attention is one thing, but capturing attention without delivering is just clickbait. So yeah, and it's and it's fleeting. You know, we want durable attention, right? That's it, it's novelty is easy. You know, we could, we could we could figure out in five minutes how to capture how to get a hundred thousand clicks on an ad. Totally. Uh, we see it all day, every day. Right? Go, <laughs> go, any, go anywhere. Yeah, go anywhere. And you see well-engineered headlines. Yeah. But that misses the point, right? It's like, you, you get the click, so what? Like, I don't want, I don't, so I don't what? want a click. What I yeah. want is a customer a year from now that buys all mm -hmm. of my stuff because I have so thoroughly over-delivered 
on what they want most. That's what I really want. Yeah. Everything else, I'm not that interested in. Like that's all I want to do is build a business where, and Andre and I talk about this all the time, our, the, the one metric, we, we optimize our business around one metric and one metric only, which is happy customers. That's it. Every decision we make is in service to creating a happy customer. Uh, and there are objective measures, but they're mostly subjective measures, but we, it's clicks and leads and who cares? Uh, it's people. I want people who are delighted, who if I showed up at something they were doing virtually, in person, they would genuinely be glad to see me. They're like, yes. oh, I'm not that idiot. But they would be like, hey, there's this thing. I have this question. Like yeah. maybe if I get a chance to hang out with Safi Bacall and he would answer my damn questions, darn questions, sorry, YouTube, about his writing frameworks. Anyway, Alex, this has been yep. such a pleasure. Oh I'm so God. excited to talk to your Rainmakers. Uh, the Rainmaker That's thing is going to be crazy, though. We're going, we're going stupid deep with the rainmakers stupid. again that's going to be the, stupid. the title i'll be like stupid deep <laughs> marketing that's a, stupid deep writing hold on i want to try something that's oh it gosh. that's what we're doing sean thank you so freaking much i mean this conversation already just my gears are turning and i know everyone watching will absolutely be like oh my gosh this is amazing uh so if anyone wants to find out more about sean and andre and their programs i'll put a link in the description below i'll also link the ted talk from ben zander that you mentioned and yeah sean thank you so much this was so much fun anytime you want to geek out about marketing you know who to call oh, careful what you wish for thank you alex <laughs> thanks bye all right, guys, if you enjoyed that video, make sure to check out the next one from me right here. And you can click right here to get a free gift. Are copywriting courses really worth it? Well, in my opinion, there are four deal breakers that a legit copywriting course must include to be worth your time and money.